Okay, so I think uh, we should uh, proceed to the next part of the lecture. As I mentioned when I uh, told you a bit about the agenda, uh, I'll be starting out by talking about uh, starting out with uh, talking about the team and the importance of the team and how to get and establish a, a good team dynamic. Uh, after that, actually, a person who just arrived, uh, Jens Christian Fode, will be talking about his organization, Connect Denmark, which is really interesting, an organization that I have used quite a bit in my own company. Um, but let's start off with the, talking about the team. Um, I think I'd uh, like to hear your input on this, uh, just to, to get going. Because uh, I know this is uh, quite a different uh, question, but uh, it's something I'd like your answer on. Why are we actually working on writing a business plan? Any inputs on that? Back there? The thing about business plan is that we get around the, the whole compromisation and the cover all the aspects and it also make us think about a lot of things that we maybe haven't discussed in the group. And for us to know both how viable the idea is and from which to uh, point the market. Very true. Sure. Any other inputs while we're writing a business plan? Yeah? Uh, to minimize the uncertainty. Of the Very good point. Yes, there was one by front in front here. Nice tool to show to investors and other people who might, might involve in the project too. You can show them uh, when the, how your turnover and the project plan is, how they can benefit from it. It's very good point as well. And absolutely true, all of it. Um, and uh, this is also what I'm essentially pointing out in, in these points here. Um, there is, however, uh, another you know, very important but uh, somewhat hidden dimension to the business plan. And uh, that's what uh, the team is actually about, to show that your team is up uh, for the task of actually bringing this idea to the market. Uh, and, well, and that you have the right you know, selection of uh, competencies and you have the right, uh, as I said, dynamic for actually getting there. And um, just to clarify this a little bit, I'll go on to this next slide, because um, there's always going to be a difference between, you know, um, well, your plan for the business. Well, that's essentially your business plan. We are here. We can see these different things going on. We can identify these different par potential partners and, uh, and, um, and stakeholders. And from, you know, analyzing that context, we can sort of set out a course and say, we want to end up here. You have all kinds of different, uh, different ideas of we want to go into this segment and we want to sell it in this way at this price and things like that. The fact is just that, you know, the investor pretty much knows that this plan, you know, it's, it's pretty good, but that's not, what, that's not what's really going to happen. What the investor is and actually anticipating is this, that along the way you'll bump into a, an object, some kind of a barrier, uh, some kind of contextual change. And uh, you'll have to essentially change your business plan. You'll have to reevaluate it and see, okay, which direction should we go in now? And that'll happen again and again and again. And at the end, you might not even be ending up at the same, same place where you, you know, started, up, started out uh, thinking you'd end up. So actually, what does the, uh, the investor want to know? Well, essentially, the investor wants to know if the team is able to respond to these uh, changes in prerequisites uh, that are bound to occur. So what happens each time something you know, gets in the way of the business plan? Are you able to reevaluate and set a new course and be efficient about that? Um, so that's the other hidden part of the business plan. So you should be good at uh, reanalyzing the market. Should be good at uh, reevaluating the business plan itself on the basis of your analysis of the market. Of course, you should be able to reprioritize, uh, reprioritizing your focus. Uh, maybe you're focusing on this thing in one instance, and the, the, the in the next instance, you'll have to look somewhere completely different. And of course, uh, when you look at something like that, you you're bound to uh, you know you probably have to kill some darlings along the way. Maybe you thought that this really good idea for addressing this segment, uh, you know, maybe you really want that to, to work out, you want that to proceed. But having seen the new context and having seen these new changed circumstances, you have to reevaluate that and say, okay, we can't proceed with that. So 
kill that darling. And of course, you'll have to be able to adapt very quickly to these changes. Because if you spend time, you know, just wandering around trying to figure out what to do, that's money spent and investors don't want that. So um, this requires a team um, that has, you know, competencies obviously within the right fields. Um, you'll have to uh, have a clear code of conduct so that, you know, in, we have to always be able to reevaluate things. We have to be able to, you know, say that our, we reevaluate, re for instance, our business plan every month or every second month or things like that. I'm not necessarily saying you have to do that. You have to have clear rules uh, from which you can, uh, can work. Um, and also, the next part is maybe quite strange at this stage, but you probably have to have uh, very clear responsibilities. So, you know, maybe you're a mechanical engineer and many of you are, uh, but uh, you should be ready to be the finance, chief financial officer of the company just because we need someone to have that role. We need someone who's always on top of it when something comes up with regards to the financials of the company. We need someone who handles the technical stuff. I think we have a lot of persons who could do that here and we need someone to be the manager of the outside, you know, the, uh, the face of the company uh, to uh, stakeholders and to investors and things like that. So uh, this brings me to another very important point, the psychology of an investor meeting. Because up until now, you've probably thought that an investor meeting is about you, know, you showing a business plan. It's showing that you have all these things in order. But actually, you know, as I just told you, uh, there's a hidden part to it as well. And um, you need to show that you are efficient and that you probably created this business plan, you know, just overnight and it still looks brilliant. So that the investor knows that the next time something comes up, you're again able to reevaluate your business plan and change the dire direction overnight. So in, that, in relation to that, it's actually more important to be concise and, you know, show initiative than to be very precise and, you know, get all the details in there. As I, as I write here, you can always, uh, you can always add the details later and Trust me, the investor will be wanting the details at a later stage. Um, and also, again, investors tend to speak this language uh, about ROIs and EBITs and, and things like that. And that's because, you know, that's the language of uh, business plans and that's the language they want you to speak uh, in order to quickly communicate to them that now you've changed your course and now you're doing this and because you can see a higher EBIT potential somewhere, things like that. So be prepared for that because if my, the tendency is that the investors think more in terms like this and not that much in uh, what I call engineering nonsense. But uh, I might be uh, more, you know, uh, uh, more of a fan of uh, the engineering stuff, but the investors sure aren't. And then there's uh, the last and I'd say the most important point. Uh, when you're at an investment meeting, you'll probably have an investor asking you something like this. Uh, we'd like you to you know, take a closer look at Japan because it seems like a really interesting market. And you might think, okay, well, that's a bit strange. That's a bit out of the air because you have done some analysis and, and Japan didn't seem like a, a very interesting place. But what they're really doing is this. Um, they're essentially giving you an assignment. They're saying, okay, we're now gonna provide a change of context and see how this group adapts to that. So that's completely different. They want you to see, uh, and that you'll probably get a few days for you know, uh, returning on that and writing them a, a nice document. And what they want to see is that you evaluate this new opportunity, see if it's something that's interesting to you or not, and you may not ever use that again. But at that stage, they've realized whether or not this is a group that's actually able to quickly analyze and adapt to circumstances. So about building the team, the first very important thing, of course, is setting the expectations. Because um, in your case, and in many cases, a tip, an idea typically emerges between you know, one to five persons. They work together on a technology or something like that, and they come up with this idea, and you know, what do they do from there? Uh, well, going on, uh, they have to uh, figure out who's gonna put the effort into this, who's gonna be the person uh, driving this idea forward and actually building a business around it. And you might figure out that some of you are willing to put in 100%, some of you are willing to put in 20%, some others are willing to put in 150%, things like that. 
And you need to discuss that, that among yourselves because otherwise you won't get a clear understanding of how much you can ask from your group members or your team members. And when you get to that point, you may realize that, okay, we actually need some competencies and we need someone to fill in these spots because we just don't have the work resources or the human resources uh, that we need for solving these problems. And that's when the next very important step comes in. Uh, you need to go out there and see if you can find people who are able to you know, help you with these things. Uh, and in many cases, it would be very relevant for you to get maybe a guy or a girl from uh, CBS or you know, someone who knows something about uh, patents or whatever. Um, you need to be able to see where your shortcomings are and you need to be able to realize how can we actually get someone from the outside in to strengthen our well, organization as it is. So what I'd like now is for you to do an exercise on that exact thing. And uh, before we proceed with that, uh, I'd actually like to ask you uh, to uh, provide a well, short uh, summary of uh, your considerations about this area, because I know you're one of the groups who've actually been involved. Uh, you've been actually uh, looking at your interests and your level of commitment and things like that going forward. Yeah, what uh, we've been discussing is that um, our project is, is interesting. It might be interesting to take uh, to another level uh, and actually go into making a business. Um, but not all of the group members uh, want to do this. Actually, uh, Andreas, who uh, came up with the idea initially, is, is really uh, into doing this as a business. And, and he would like to continue with this. But before he does that, we would like to kind of get a confirmation that the idea is actually worth going forward with. Uh, and what we are going to try to do is uh, put it on Kickstarter. If, and if it's possible to raise the capital, then Andreas is going to go on with the with the work um, and uh, he needs to to have some to have another team so to speak because all of us can do pretty much much of the same stuff um, and we he would like to get someone in who knows a lot about uh, app programming because that's quite an essential part of the product project um, and he would like to do it as as a free uh, spare time project so he, he doesn't want to go in full time at least not uh, in the beginning Okay. So that's the that's his plan for now. Um, we haven't quite decided if, if any of uh, us is gonna go uh, go with him on the project uh, yet. But I think uh, he's certainly up for it uh, for the challenge. Cool. That's brilliant. So thanks for that. And uh, what I'd like to do you to do now is uh, each of you, and I don't mean each group. I mean each, I mean each person of each group, uh, just uh, sits there thinking for a minute or so about. What do you think you'll be doing with regards to this idea uh, six months out? And it's, as you just heard, it's completely legitimate to say that, okay, I'm not going to do anything about this six months out. This, I'm not going to be a part of this. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, I'd like you to uh, summarize um, to your group what your thoughts are, uh, five minutes in total. Uh, I don't think any of the groups are more than five people. And uh, finally, uh, we'd like the different... Uh, with just a few of you to summarize to the class what you uh, came up with. So one minute thinking by yourself, one minute uh, telling your group, and uh, after that we'll just uh, do a quick uh, round of uh, inputs in the class. So proceed with that. So. It seems like uh, there's a lot of discussion going on, but I think uh, just to save some time, I think we should proceed and uh, see if any of the groups have uh, come up with uh, some, uh, some uh, interesting conclusions. Um, should we just uh, start with uh, one of the groups? Maybe, uh, yeah, this group back here at the table. Have you discussed uh, your uh, expectations for uh, six months out? Yeah, we have. Okay. 
So you're so essentially a bit scared to commit to an idea that you can't protect I mean, and that you don't know you can get the value out of it. Well, yeah, I mean, in six months' time, I don't know if we can all commit to saying six months' sure. we'll definitely know if we can enter and do everything we can to get it through. To it. We, don't, we don't think it's going to make us millions of That's good. But that's fair. Thanks a lot for that input. Uh, should we just take the group up here? Yeah, actually, we didn't have time to discuss it yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let's move on to a group that actually discussed it. Uh, you have the one at the back. Yeah, we discussed uh, that uh, we're gonna uh, that uh, one of us has has a lot of time to spend on it, uh, and uh, I will have. I'm trying to kind of be driving this project like I'm, I'm doing right now, and it doesn't matter how, how it goes for venture. We wanna go all the way to to seeing how users will react to our product. Cool. And uh, so the, the rest of the group is has the same role. Sounds very good. Good to hear. Okay, uh, group up here. Yeah, uh, in six months time, uh, we wouldn't really uh, continue working with this because uh, yeah, we're all still uh, studying at VTU and, mm -hmm. and this project will require all of our time. That's fair. Cool. Um, should we take the license plate? Yeah, uh, I think four out of five of us uh, would like to continue if we have a success in, in Chicago. Okay. Uh, if we have like somebody who's believing in the idea, because we have, as we see, we have two major hurdles that we have to come across because we, we kind of ran into a main field of, of legislation and, and, and patents and that, that it, it's a little bit difficult to see if, if, if we can and okay. business because we still believe in the, in the concept. Cool. Great. So thanks for that input. I think we'll be moving on now. Um, uh, the next part is actually distributing the ownership of the company. For instance, if you do uh, a limited company uh, among you, and there are a lot of ways of, of doing this. Uh, the only, as one article said, the only wrong way of doing it is dividing it 50-50 uh, or you know, equally among you. Um, because that doesn't reflect uh, you know, the different responsibilities of the different persons in the group. Maybe one is CEO, maybe one commits 100%, maybe another commits 25%, things like that. That needs to be accounted for in the shares held by different persons. Um, so um, you need to discuss this, and it's not something that you can start discussing when you sit down with the investor, because then suddenly the investor is negotiating with four or five different people and not just, you know, uh, a solid dynamic entity. So you need to figure this out. And you know, just a ge as a general rule, what you need is bakers, not eaters. If you want to share the company, you need to provide something. You, need, you can't just be part of the company to take something out of it. You need to be in it to give something. And that also relates to the investors. You should never uh, just get an investor to uh, provide money. You should also get an investor to get knowledge and get help. So uh, what I have down here is actually a framework for dividing the shares. And what you do is essentially you go through these points. I won't go through them now. You can do it on your own time at some stage. And uh, you end up with a number for each person, a number of shares. You start with 100 shares each. And then you, uh, you know, uh, if you're the one who got the idea, uh, several of you are, you uh, multiply that by, well, 1.05 and so forth uh, concerning the different uh, points down here. I would draw out one point though, oh sorry, two points. Uh, the commitment to full time has a lot of value. If you're willing to commit full time to the project, uh, you get a lot of shares for that. Also, if you can actually get a, a so-called super entrepreneur on the team, someone who's actually done several companies before, uh, that person you know, can, uh, you know, essentially by himself or by herself uh, create the basis for you being an, uh, you know, a, an object that's uh, worthwhile investing in. So uh, a super entrepreneur can actually get quite a significant part of the company shares. But again, uh, just keep this in mind if you want to do this discussion and then you can take it up maybe at the group session. Um, another important point is that uh, there's a difference between, you know, the relative uh, power of the shareholder when you see uh, from seeing at you know uh, the share percentage 
and the actual you know responsibilities and um, and uh, power held within the company because uh, you know in the daily operation of the company it would be the management who would take decisions and decide on different suppliers and things like that then once in a while you would have a board a uh, board meeting and the board members at this board meeting would be you know elected by the shareholders and sometimes you have a shareholder that only, maybe it's a board of five persons and you have a shareholder that only holds maybe 20% this could be an investor for instance but this person's uh, um, requirement for going into the company is that they have, to, they, they have to be able to point out two board members. So you just have to remember that there's a difference between you know, the number of shares you have and the amount of power you have in a company. I won't go too much into that. Uh, and also just as a general note, when you're in a startup, you can't just be this really tech specific guy or this really project planning specific uh, girls. You have to have, you know, a so-called so T-shape uh, personality or T-shaped uh, T set of competencies. You essentially need to know what the other guys are doing. Uh, because if, let's say, uh, one group member gets sick, you have to be able to progress the company without that group member being part of it. And you need to be able to understand what everyone else is doing in order to do quick decisions and to, as I said earlier, quickly uh, re-evaluate uh, your uh, current business plan uh, upon you know, changes in the context. Um, and uh, now I'll be introducing uh, the next speaker, uh, Jens Christian Fode from Connect Denmark. Jens Christian is actually someone I've used a heck of a lot uh, with my own company, Edgeflow, uh, because his organization actually is pretty much what you need at this stage. You have a lot of ideas, you have a a lot of uh, assumptions, but you need to value, validate them with the context or with the market. And uh, in, in Christian's network, we have well thousands upon thousands of well relevant persons to a company like you. And uh, Jens Christian will spend the next uh, 25 minutes or so talking about uh, Connect Denmark. So Jens Christian, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? It works. Fantastic. Well, good uh, morning, everyone, or late morning. Um, as Jakob mentioned, my name is Jens Christian. Um, you can see my surname there. I'm not going to try and pronounce it in English. You can try and find any way to pronounce it in English that you want. Uh, there's been many ways of doing that. But uh, Jens Christian is fine, and uh, I work with uh, Connect Denmark. Um, I think Jakob asked me to be here today because um, in the process of starting his own company, um, we ran into each other. Um, I hardly remember how, um, but actually working with um, the architectural company that you used to work with, uh, Jakob had done this uh, PhD study and said, well, maybe this is a grounds of starting something new. And in connection with one of the partners at this architectural company, they said, well, what can we do to launch this? Um, and basically the idea was good. Uh, they were slowly starting to form a team to get this company rolling. And at that point, they said, well, then what? And that's actually why I'm here, to give you a kind of a perspective on how to commercialize your ideas. I've seen that you've been through a number of very good speakers within the last months. Uh, so a lot of information that I'm bringing here will probably be supplementary, or maybe even some will overlap with what you've heard already. So I would, based on Jakob's introduction to this, focus a little bit on what Connect does and give you a bit of background on what we, what we have done uh, and how we do it. Maybe to uh, give you a quick introduction to myself, um, I'm kind of a split personality, if you could talk professionally, in the sense that uh, I started my career in a Danish company uh, of which the founder actually not the founder, but the son of the founder died yesterday. You might have heard of him, he's called Mursk. Um, for those stains of you, you probably know him at least. I spent about 13 years with that company. Uh, so that was kind of my inauguration to real society. Um, I don't have a university degree. Uh, actually, the way I started working was working with this Danish company. Um, so I educated myself kind of in the field. 
uh, what I usually say is the best hands-on training I've ever had was with this company called AP Muller Merz. So you could say that actually from the outset, I started with this company when I was 19. Actually from the outset, I've been kind of an entrepreneur, even though an entrepreneur within brackets in the sense that AP Muller is a very rich company. So I never lacked uh, the financing to do what I wanted to do. But I was able to travel around the world, start up new companies, start up new initiatives for this company. So actually the entrepreneurial side I've been working with ever since I started. But it was only until I left Maersk in 2003 that I found out what it actually was to be an entrepreneur but without financing. And that's of course one of the main challenges that you'll be facing in starting up your company. So maybe before I begin my presentation, uh, just to get a quick feel, and I heard that some of you are planning on starting up, no matter what. Some of you want to win the Venture Cup. Great ambition. Uh, not necessarily that Venture Cup will give you your first you know, launch, or that you're necessarily successful because you win Venture Cup. But it's a very good starting point to get some ideas through uh, and to get some business people to look at your ideas. But to get, your, well, to get a feel for your challenges, maybe you could just share with me, in your opinion, what are the main challenges for you in starting up? Or the main challenge? Maybe a quick show of... Even though Denmark says that we are an international country, then that's not quite true always, huh? So. We're very international in Europe. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Any other? Yeah? I think in our team we discussed that we, we lack the, the competences of uh, software development management and how to work in this environment of software developers. So you have an idea, you have a concept, and you need some people to actually work the code. Yeah, yeah. Okay. and manage the, the software project. So we also lack the management skills as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if we are going to launch, then we have to make a physical product. Uh, we have to get the, some, you know, some devices, so we have to get some capital for the first batch and stuff like that. That's the major issues. So, so building a prototype and finding the money to do so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. You have one more? No. Yeah. Okay. So actually very operational things. Um, now you're not talking strategy uh, yet. There's something about the team, something about the legal side and maybe, uh, as you say, the language barrier. Of course, one of, the, one of those challenges you could probably solve by starting up in another country. But that being said, we would of course want you to do that in Denmark. But um, yeah, something as simple as doing a product and not having the money to do so. I mean, these are kind of the challenges that we meet every day when we talk to entrepreneurs such as yourselves. And uh, what I would want to do a little bit here is to discuss or give you an idea of how we work uh, the way we introduce ideas to the market, the way we help ideas and especially teams to grow, um, and then hopefully also throughout the presentation get a little bit of interaction with you uh, to try and, you know, can we actually move on some of these things that you're talking about in terms of finding the next step to do something about the challenges that you have. What I want to uh, quickly run through today with you, I have about 25 minutes for a presentation. Um, I'll try and do it slightly shorter, but give you a background of what we are, who we are, uh, try and give you some perspective on how we evaluate the commercial potential of a company, and then looking at how do we actually work with maturing that company towards com commercialization. And a lot of the methods actually that we're using is something that you could probably copy uh, or use in your own work uh, during your stay here. 
Um, so I will come back to, to some of that. Basically, uh, what Connects Denmark is all about is it starts all the way back to 1985 when um, this founding group uh, of fathers uh, went together in San Diego and said, guys, we have some economic problems in our society, a huge amount of ideas lying around in university, just like here. How do we actually put these universities or these ideas into use and start bringing them to market? So in San Diego, actually, that was uh, the first step towards uh, also uh, what is today Connect Denmark in the sense that we've actually, kind of like a software, we've copied the source. We've copied some of the ways of bringing uh, ideas to market that was invented here in San Diego in 1985. The basic idea of bringing together industry, business, university and investors is actually what we've copied today. Um, I regret some of this is in Danish, some is in English, but still, as you can see, what we bring together is actually the entrepreneurs at the top. We have a lot of business developers, we have the investors. Actually, Søren Helena here at the bottom was until recently attached to DTU. So he has kind of been a, a representative that we work with in DTU to bring ideas to market. We work with the likes of DI, which is Danish business organization. And then we work with the private enterprises. So basically what Connect is all about is actually connecting the society in terms of bringing good ideas to market. So our network consists of people from all of these different aspects of society. So when Jakob says building a network, trying to get somebody to support what you're doing, actually the way we support it is actually to plug you in to this network, to try and find out who can best help you take the next step. Well, that's lawyers to help your legal uh, troubles, maybe uh, sometimes translating those documents, whether it's finding the right resource to build your company, or whether it's finding financing with the investors to start building your company. Then what we do is to try and, and direct you to the right place. Very quickly, that what we do is actually what we do is to challenge and develop growth companies. At least that's our mission. We do this uh, with a number of sparring courses, events, meetings. And what's special about Connect is that we are not a, we're not a, a public institution. Actually, what, how the way we are financed is that all these people in our network pay a little bit to make this happen. So what we are, we are a non-profit membership organization. And when you participate in the organization, actually what people do is that they pay, they pay to give away good advice. I know that sounds maybe a little bit strange because as a business model, I guess if you went to CBS, they would all say you must be nuts. But actually paying and contributing at the same time is possible as long as we don't take too much money from these people. So we work with sponsors and we have today 13 employees being, should we say, paid by these sponsors. But it's not so much the 13 employees as it is this network of about 900 people, active people, that help us to bring companies to life. In a year, we help around 100 to 120 companies. And actually today, we have a, a cooperation with the Danish Vekstfonden, some of you might know, a National Growth Fund, where also companies end up by finding invest, investment. At the bottom it says we're part of this global connect. So in case you're interested in connecting with people worldwide with regards to your uh, startup, that's also possible. I always take too much time when I'm on stage. So just to give you a quick idea, this is a survey we did a couple of years back. Uh, at the time we had helped about 350 companies within a project of two years. And what's, main of, uh, what's the mo most important here is that what we measure is that we actually bring capital to these companies, or at least that the companies succeed in raising capital. Some find customers, some find board members, and some, again, find partners. And again, some of you mentioned um, you know, being a small team, not having all the skills. What you need to find out is where are your strengths and weaknesses, and then start partnering up on the elements that you don't have any strengths. These are some of the companies that we helped. Uh, I haven't put on Edgeflow, uh, but they, Edgeflow was, co of course, one of them. Um, I, I guess compared to recent uh, activity in the entrepreneurship world, you might have heard about Podio. 
which was recently sold to Citrix, uh, a large software collaboration developer. Um, and Podio, I don't know if you've used it here, but if you haven't, uh, I would recommend it. It's a, good, it's a lot a of the tool. groups are actually using Podio. And earlier today, when we did a lecture, uh, I did a lecture. I saw Tommy Ellis. It was one of the one of the cases actually for uh, for why to start up. <laughs> so I'd say they're very much. Uh, I very saw much you had, you had a lecture from Tommy Ellis as well. So I guess he told you the story. Endomondo is an interesting software as well. Uh, running software it samples everything on your GPS on your mobile. I think they have at least 8 million users now and they have moved to uh, uh, Silicon Valley. Um, another interesting one, Secunia develops IT security software. Um, Imudex is a special biotech unit. Octoshape facil facilitates HD uh, transmission uh, online on the, on the web. Um, so a lot of interesting and a few games as well. So these are some of the companies that we've helped, but you know, the, the pool is larger than this. So, getting an early perspective on your commercialization, why is that relevant? I, I don't know if you've heard these quotes already or have heard them before, but certainly if you look back uh, and then uh, and, uh, in hindsight then tell yourself, well, maybe they should have talked to some people outside, uh, but definitely it showed that, you know, history showed that, that uh, it sometimes can be good to get a new perspective on your thoughts, on your attitudes towards commercialization. I love the one from Bill Gates. 640K ought to be enough memory for anybody. So, so in order to get that perspective on commercialization, what we look at as Connect Denmark is, uh, uh, should we say, put in a triangle is around four things. The main one is the team. Um, basically, uh, this is where it starts and where it ends. Uh, now, your ambition to start up or your ambition to to make this a success is actually what's going to drive this through. Um, and that's also where we start. I mean, if we are going to help a company, uh, then we want to know that the founders, that the, the management, the leader of the company is interested in making this a success. So that's where we start. The team is not only about the, the, the people, but it's also about formulating the right path for the team and for the company. And of course, having some kind of vision and ambition with what you do. Looking at the value proposition, uh, I think you've been through this already in one of your courses, but definitely, again, you know, value proposition is an, an easy word, and at CBS I know it's being used every day, uh, not always in the right context. Um, I, I guess the main challenge here is actually to find out what are you actually doing. Um, Connect Denmark actually ourselves, we are a small startup company. Um, I joined Connect about four years ago, when we were five people, now we're 13. And actually, we've been through kind of what we would call a growth process with a small entrepreneur. So, so um, one of my personal learnings with starting up in a small company is that actually when you start out, you have no clue what you're doing. I mean, you might have an idea of a concept or a product or maybe you have a dream of where you want to go or where you want to live or how much money you want to make. But what is it actually that you're proposing to the market? Many companies, when they start up, have absolutely no clue. That's my, uh, should we say, uh, pro provo provocation towards you this morning. But how many of you are able to formulate a value proposition that any customer would buy? Now, you will have the chance at Venture Cup to, uh, should we say, come up with a value proposition, test it towards the audience. But my question to you is, how many of your potential customers have you tested your value proposition towards? And the customers that you will discuss or that you will work with initially, will they be a very focused target group or will they be a lot of different groups where you don't really know how those groups will take your company or take your product in? So just reflecting back to you, how many of you have actually already Talk to potential customers for your product. Okay, so there are four, five, six groups maybe, yeah? And what did they tell you? Yeah? They're very interested in the idea and they see a great potential. So very positive feedback. 
Okay. Um, there are some reliability issues that we need to uh, work on, but um, yeah, we're working on that okay. as well. So it's really, like, from my perspective, it's nice to get in contact with the uh, customers because you get that really valuable feedback um, on your product. And, and what did they do to your product development, talking to the customer? What it does? Did it change the way that you looked at your product? Or? Um, well, it changed the what the focus of our product development. That there is a, it made the barriers very clear. That there are some barriers that we need to, to look at before we can move on. So. Okay. Yeah. And did you talk to one customer or several? We talked to um, two. I think. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any other comments on talking to customers, potential customers? Did you learn anything? Yeah? yeah we made a, a survey where we um, had our, our idea validated. Um, most, of, most of the thoughts we had about our product were, were, were right, we think. Um, so we didn't learn that much new, but it, uh, it gave us validation of our product. Good. So you're not completely naked when you run out into the market and tell everyone they would have to buy a product. Excellent. Yeah? Yes, but uh, some, some uh, companies do that. I think that Apple, one of the most successful companies in the world, they have the other approach where they don't do like these user groups or user studies that just make a product that they know you would like. Side, side, so mm -hmm. that's the other approach. Yeah. I think that, okay, one of the main differences with Apple and where you are right now yeah. is, is that they probably can finance the development they need to do before they go into the market. But, you know, fair point. Yeah. I spoke to uh, BNO, Bang & Olufsen, the Danish uh, audio developer, uh, a year or two ago. And uh, their perspective was exactly as you say that uh, their research department, they knew what the customers wanted. So my question back to them was, how come then that nobody's buying your product? Because things were going down the drain. That person is actually no longer with being Bang & Olufsen, but that's another story. But I'm not saying that you should be completely directed by your customers. But the point is, how would you want to know what people are willing to pay for unless you ask them? So I'm not talking about necessarily completely developing everything along to the customer's mind because there are things that the customer today will think he needs, but he doesn't in the future. And there are things he doesn't know he needs that he will need in the future. But who knows what he will need in the future? So that's kind of a, a tough one. But my point with this is get out there and test your product quickly, early. See what the kind of reactions that you get and then make certain that the people that you talk to, your target customers, that you understand what drives them. Because the two customers that you spoke with, they might have a different view than a, another customer group that you will talk to. So again, depending on the target group, you will have different feedback. Quickly on the market opportunity, some of the things that, for example, when you're raising money, that, that the investors will ask you about is, what on earth is this actually addressing a market that we're interested in or a market which is growing or which is large? So, so these are, of course, some of the things that you need to consider. At this point, it might be tough because you don't necessarily have the insight into that particular market. But as Jacob was mentioning earlier, get somebody who knows that market to start giving you some advice on how it works. And then, of course, the financing, which kind of financing to go for at which stage. We look at the companies to find out which development stage are you at and which kind of financing would you then be eligible for. I mean, the FFF, I don't know if you've had that already here. A little later. A little later, okay. Then uh, fools, friends, and family. Uh, so that's where it starts, basically. You know, if nobody else trusts your idea and you need money, that's where you go. Grants, and then an, an over, uh, overlooked element of financing is, of course, customer projects. Or trying to get in touch with potential customers and seeing if they're willing to pay your development costs. That's an important part of financing. The other ones you will get back to when you look at funding. Looking at a very 
overall uh, schematic way, um, if you look at, for example, the business potential crossed with the team's ability to actually realize this potential, what investors, what we as commercial, uh, should we say, gatekeepers or screeners would look at is the right side of this triangle, you know, where you have a good idea and a good team. But I would say that having the right team with a mediocre idea is actually better than having a very good idea with a bad team. In the sense that, you know, if you don't have the people to execute this, then forget about it. An idea is fantastic, but nothing is interesting until it's executed. So again, the team is more important than the idea. Have you heard this before? Or does it make sense? Um, I hope so. Because again, team, team, team. What Connect does is actually at different stages of the con uh, company's development, we work with the company to give some new input or some validation or some insight as to what is the commercial potential of this. Depending on where you start, from before start until you launch a new market or a new product, we actually provide network or business people to come and validate your ideas and to bring you forward in terms of market, uh, uh, market insight and maybe act as your board members, advisors, or whatever it might be. So again, we have a large network that consists of mainly experienced business people who are interested in helping startups. So what we do is that we have not always uh, an aligned process like this, but we have different steps in which we pull in this network of business people, and then we have tailored programs depending on uh, the company that we're working with. I mean, all companies are different. They all have different challenges. So we kind of take a starting point with the individual company and then we move from there. I just need to make certain that my, my time is okay. I think uh, just briefly summing up, what we provide is uh, what we call a springboard and a network of potential board members. We provide panels to test your ideas. Uh, we provide also pitch training when it's necessary towards investors. And then we have this huge network of business people that we work with. Um, so again, contacting us, you would have a pretty good idea of what's, you know, what you lack. And mainly what we can provide is, is board members, advisory boards, uh, potential investors, etc. things like that. Our springboards, I will run very briefly through in the sense that we run springboards, 120 springboards uh, a year. Um, and that's where our companies meet our network. So these are a few recommendations from the founder of Skype. He was in code making about a year ago. I thought some of what he said was a uh, good inspiration uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, usually this is not a question of capital or ideas. It's more like a question of mindset. We have to get out there and get things done. Uh, if you want to find investors in that category, like uh, the Sky founder is today, make certain that you have a game changer. Um, what is a game changer? Or maybe you should ask the investors because only they know. And then creating something big, then make certain that you solve a problem which, which affects a lot of people. For example, like Sky. From my point of view, my recommendations, and I mean, this is very bullet point format, but again, spend a lot of time networking, get out there, uh, test your idea wherever you go, use your elevator pitch, you know, spend 30 seconds and then see how people react. Get it out there, test it, test it, test it constantly. And then again, network. Make certain that you understand different angles from different business people. Um, make certain that you use the system. There's Stardust, there's Venture Cup, there's a lot of organizations who are willing to assist. Make certain that you test your pitch, ask for feedback, team up, prioritize. <coughs> it. I mean, all these things you've heard before, I'll just reiterate them because I think they're important. But most importantly, again, get out there, get it tested, get it done. Customers, investors, people that you meet, no matter who, just test it. Yeah? Because the people will have different reactions and that will teach you something every time. A few interesting links, um, some of them you might have seen already. Um, others I can provide you some information around. Um, Guy Kawasaki is, uh, he's probably been up already, but that's about pitching. Um, how software entrepreneurs pitch to investors is, is interesting. If you are yourself going out to pitch to investors, it's a very uh, well-written document. I can provide you a copy of that if you send me your email address or uh, through Jakob, I can do that. The uh, need approach benefit competition model, uh, how to quickly uh, 
perform a value proposition, for example. Look at SRI, which is Stanford Research Institute. That's very good information. Uh, how to generate a business model, good information as well. Then there's some information about technology startups, which I can recommend at TechCrunch. Um, the innovation networks in Denmark is not to be neglected in the sense that a lot of ideas are being spun out there and networks being hap uh, happening or taking place with large companies as well. You can find them at fi.dk. Um, there are about 22 or 23 of them. And then <laughs> Startup Weekend. Um, I don't know if you've all been at Startup Weekend already. If not, um, I know that there is a Startup Weekend coming up at the end of uh, April in Aarhus. Uh, so if you're interested in actually meeting software developers, that might be a good place to go. Finally, I have um, some structure on pitching. We can talk about that when you get to the funding place uh, part, and then I can give you that if you want. That was it for me. Thank you for listening. <laughs> do we have a couple minutes for questions? Yes, I think we definitely do. Any questions for Jens Christian? What exactly did your uh, network get out of it? And um, why do they? Hopefully, Hopefully uh, in the end, uh, building great companies. Um, not all of them are there to build great companies, <coughs> but some are, and the ones that are most active are. Um, so they're actually interested in meeting companies with an interest in growing, in an ambition to uh, yeah, innovate. Uh, others uh, come actually to, uh, to listen and learn uh, in the sense that, um, let me take an example, some of the banks, uh, some of their uh, advisors are not always very uh, sharp on business development, but they know a lot about financing. So they come in, they share their information about financing, and then they learn a lot about strategy and how to develop businesses. So that's, there can be a lot of learning in it as well. And then the network, not to be neglected. Any other questions? Okay. If you have, I mean, these challenges that you've addressed or talked about earlier, uh, if you want to get in touch with people who are able to respond to some of that or help you move forward, I know Jakob is a good uh, guide for you in that sense, but that's basically also where we can start helping. Um, in terms of you know finding software developers, I would definitely recommend uh, getting out there, networking, uh, maybe at some of the IT uh, business, uh, IT um, uh, association network events. There will be a lot of software developers there. Uh, finding funding for your prototyping, I guess you will get back to that. Uh, some of the invasion environments, Seed Capital, CAT, uh, Sudansk University, etc. Um, you know, translating the Danish documents, legal documents, um, that's probably not going to be a, a, a simple ch a challenge. But we have a network of lawyers. If you want to talk to some of them, uh, they probably have documents in English if you would need that. So, um, so we, can, we can help you there if you need. Would it be okay for them to write you a mail or do you want them to do it through me instead? Sure. You can write if to me directly. If they have questions. Or, so. yeah. Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Jens Christian. And uh, I think we should uh, give Jens Christian one more hand because... Yeah. Uh, Good luck. That's our very uh, I think we'll take a 10 minute break um, and uh, be back here at uh, 15 minutes to 11.